Okay, let's start. Um, you are in the session exploring holacracy, sociocracy, and reinventing organizations in a Drupal agency. And before I uh, start, I would quickly want to know who you are. I mean, you must be here for a reason. So are you like owner of an agency? Maybe raise your hands. Okay, some uh, owner, some people working in an agency, most likely you are. <laughs> All right, happy with your current organizational model? Raise your hands. <laughs> nice, okay. All right, so let's start. I'm also an owner of a agency, Drupal agency NetNode in Switzerland, and a couple of years back, I uh, asked myself this question. How can we, as individuals, I and everybody of us, and our organizations, clients, we as an agency, uh, actually tackle 21st century challenges and foster universal thriving? So kind of finding the purpose. What should I do? What should we do as an organization? And I came up with a version, like my aspired future, is this. What if we have a sense of community, relationships and love when we go to work? What if we find inner peace between work, private life and everything in between? Or happy and have a strong sense of self-efficacy? What if we actually apply regenerative practices in our daily lives, uh, circular economy, and actually we understand that there is an abundance in nature? What if we can go to work and express our full potential, our creativity? What if we know that high-tech and low-tech um, work hand-in-hand, hand, so it's not always the latest and greatest, and that open source is a good way to go? And what if we actually understand that we only live on one Earth and that we actually have to develop an integra integral worldview? Well, this is just like words and maybe an aspired future. But I want to show you some patterns and new paradigms for maybe the future of work. So I'm going to quickly explain what yesterday's world and today's world is and new paradigms, principles, then about holacracy, sociocracy S3. Also, I want to show you how we transformed to a more distributed leadership company. And then I give you three tips on how you can start. Is that okay for you? Nice. Okay, I'm Lucas. I'm uh, the founder of Netno Digital Agency from Switzerland. I'm uh, mostly geeking about digital strategy and web technology. And recently, we founded a new project called NodeHive App, which is an eco-conscious headless CMS built on top of Drupal. While doing that, I'm also a passionate gardener. Um, so this was a good season. I don't know about yours, but the tomato exploded. Uh, I'm also a passionate uh, composter, so this is one of my warm, uh, um, uh, worms in the warmery, and I'm also a cycler. So let's go deeper with yesterday's world versus today's world, and I don't want to, you know, educate you on that, but it's more like build the ground for what I'm trying to express in this presentation. So what is the, what was the yesterday's world? Well, it was driven by oil. Um, oil has a very compressed energy and it helped us to grow our economies. So growth was after, world, uh, after the world wars um, the big thing. So actually our economy and also world population exploded. And if you compare to the decades before, it was a relative stability the last let's say 60 70 years so we had stable jobs stable income uh, consumers started everybody wanted to have a car a television and everything else and everything was driven by globalization i mean think about coca-cola everywhere in the world um, and the paradigm was maybe competition so it was like we either beat them or they beat us so Better beat them first. The management approach was 
profit driven and hierarchies were set in place or are set in place to actually handle this massive growth. It was mostly command and conquer planning and processes. So you actually set up a long term project plan and then you rigorously followed it, commanded it and controlled it. And everything happened in, you know, you could say it discreetness, or you could also say it was just intransparent. Um, I mean, I'm from Switzerland, and I'm sure you heard the stories about the Swiss banks, for example. I mean, this is a bit over uh, exaggerated, but you get the point. Today's world, also known as the VUCA world or Barney world, I won't go deeper into that, you can look that up in, on, on um, Wikipedia. It's obviously driven by digital transformation. So everything digital transforms markets, it maybe replaces markets. The explosion of generative AI will maybe replace many of us or we maybe adapt first. There is also today increased complexity, so we are interdependent more and more globalization, there's lots of information shifting around. It's not only increased complexity, but also increased pace. So everything is going faster, and that has a big, big impact on individual lives, um, whether it's personal or whatever, family systems, uh, villages, cities, and uh, societal uh, changes at, uh, at, at all. And that gives pressure towards all the systems, so they have to be more adaptable, more agile. And even for us as Drupal agency, for example, or whatever organization, yeah, we have to find an answer to that, right? Also, in today's world, there is a big value shift. I mean, think about boomers versus Generation Z. They have definitely a different approach to life. And there is climate change. Um, ecosystem breakdown, loss of bi biodiversity. We'll see how that impacts us, even in Europe. And there are all these new fancy tools, AI, IoT, robotics, that it certainly will um, yeah, change our, um, our daily lives. So this is today's world. Uh, do you agree? Is, is that uh, today's world? You experienced this? Okay, a lot of nodding. So my question is actually, this is the management approach of yesterday, and maybe for, of a lot of company even today. And the question is, is that still viable for today's and tomorrow's world? And my personal answer is not, but I ask you, is your organization ready for tomorrow? So this presentation is about new paradigms for the future of work, and I will explain the concepts and the foundations of it, how, um, yeah, how we can tackle that. And actually, we don't have to look too far. Um, as developers or whatever agencies, we know agile methods, Scrum, Kanban, uh, maybe you heard of getting things done, maybe use it, design thinking, OKRs, I mean, there are many of these labels and these ideas and systems, and I'm certainly you practiced them in some form. And I'm less a fan of uh, whatever a specific system, but more of the question, what are the fun foundations of that? And I will go deeper with that now. And I want to quote this book, Reinventing Organization by Frederick Lalu, and I'm not sure who knows this book. Maybe raise your hands. A couple of it, that's nice. And um, I mean, the story of Frederick Lalu is very interesting. He uh, was a consultant, I guess, in one of the big uh, consulting organizations. And then he went on a journey to um, yeah, travel around the world and went to organizations who had somehow a different approach to management. And he came up with this book and documented it. And one of the key results is he came up with this model of these circles. And I will explain it very quickly. So you see five circles. It's the red, orange, um, uh, yellow, orange, green, and teal circle. And each of these circles has specific criteria. And it's not that this is like black or white or correct or wrong. It's a model. It's an abstraction of 
um, of reality, you could say, and it's a map for me. It's like a map for myself and for my organization, and to discuss ab about it. And I want to explain each of these circles rather quickly. Let's start with red. So red is the impulsive circle, and in the impulsive circle, the management approach is: you do what I say, or I kill you. You know, there is one big boss. Uh, an example is the mafia or the street gang. Think about that. There is a yellow, a yellow circle. Yellow circle, you can call it a traditional approach. A management approach is we do it very structured and very bureaucrat bureaucratic. Think about, let's say, the military or traditional churches, governance, university schools. And the goal was with this um, iteration in the, in the organizational structure was to, they introduced replicable repi processes and st a stable organization chart, right? Next circle is the orange circle or also called the achievement circle. And the management approach is we innovate, we compete, we win and we make a lot of money. Work hard, play hard. Right? Examples, think about multinational corporations, universities, startups who want to gain the whole market in the world. And this was driven by thinking about innovation. Innovation is a good thing, so we can grow. It's accountability. If we can get, uh, you have, we have to go there and you get uh, promotion when we um, get to this goal. And, and that's actually the very positive positive thing about the orange circle. It's the concept of meritocracy. Basically, it was the first time in history where people who were not born into a certain status had the ability to go up the ladder. Uh, I mean, think about maybe a child of a farmer from the lands becoming the CEO of a multinational company. Co company. This was not possible before, right? Or not possible um, based on these principles. That's the orange circle. Then there is the green circle, also called the pluralist approach. Management approach is, we are a family, we are all equal, people, planet, profit. Think about non-profits, NGOs, software companies, and aspects of it is empowerment, it's value-driven culture, and it's also a stakeholder value. Nor o not only shareholder value, but also stakeholder value. I think lots of people working with open source or maybe even Drupal, they are were tending to be in this green circle. I certainly are with NetNode. But Lalu found uh, an additional circle. And it was actually interesting that there is something new evolving or it's, it exists already and that he called it the teal approach, integral worldview. And the management approach is, we are a self-managed, holistic, and adaptive organization. We dance with the system. So what does, what does that mean? You think about the company like Patagonia. Uh, they, I think it was this year, they released that all the profits they make, they give to nature. So basically, they have a big fund and they uh, invest the money into um, projects, um, saving whatever they want to save. Yeah. There are many other organizations. I, I cannot go into too much detail, but it's very interesting. So this Teal organization have a new approach to how they organize. One is self-management, wholeness, and evolutionary purpose. I will go into deeper into that in the following slides. So I said it's it's like a model, and my question to you is. Where would you place your organization there? Are you orange? Maybe even yellowish? Or already teal? It's an interesting discussion. So, what are these typical characteristics of green and teal organizations? What, what can we learn from these organizations? And how do they actually work? It tends to be that they are organized not in hierarchies, but in circles. So this is an illustration from a holacracy uh, standpoint. So you have circles. A circle has 
clear boundaries. A circle has a purpose. And within a circle, you have roles. And new circles can evolve. They can be destroyed. New roles can evolve. They can be destroyed. Stuff can merge. So it's like a more organic approach. So it's not a, 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 a static, hierarchical um, um, power structure. Dynamic roles is another characteristic. What does it mean? A dynamic role is basically something that you can name. Uh, let's say the holocratic approach is you give it a name, a role has a purpose, and the role has a set of accountabilities. Uh, it could be a marketing role, and purpose is obviously do marketing and bring our services, products to the market. Accountabilities, you can list them. But now, instead of keep them static, there is a process in place to make this, change this role on the fly, basically all the time. Actually, then when there is a tension, and the tension leans, leads to a change in accountabilities. So there is a way, an understanding that roles are not fixed, but they are actually fluid and can change whenever they um, need to. There's also a prototyping mindset. So instead of command and control in more traditional organizations, it's more like a sense and response approach. And this is actually a saying from uh, sociocracy. They say, it's good enough for now and safe enough to try. So why wait until the boss decides and give a go? We actually um, consent on something and they say, it's good enough now and, we, and safe enough to try it. So let's do it. Very important for um, green and teal organizations. Consent decision making. Um, this is a little bit tricky. Who is aware of consent decision making, actually? And who, is, who has experience with it? Do you do it in your company? OK, I quickly ex explain it. So actually, the, the, the idea is no one objects. So it's not that you have to say to some uh, yes to say yes to something, but you actually have to say, I'm OK with that, or I, I do not object. I make an example. So let's think about this three person. The first person wants to um, go and eat pizza. Uh, the second one wants to have a spaghetti. And the third one wants to have vegan food. Oh, so OK, how do we agree on that? How do we decide on that? If we go with the, cons uh, the consensus mode, and I quickly consensus mode, we are actually here. So we try to find a shared preference. So we have to discuss and negotiate all the time until everybody agrees on. Right? In consent mode, you actually say, uh, to what proposal do you object or not object? So it's actually the bigger one. So it's actually shared range of tolerance. So let's say this lady suggests, oh, let's go to pizzeria. Uh, do you object? And then nobody says, oh, actually, I'm fine because the vegan guy says, well, I'm sure they have vegan food. And the pizza guy is anyway happy. And the lady says, I'm pretty sure that they also serve pasta. So they can go on. So they don't have to agree on and decide that and find consensus. Very powerful concept. Try it out in your daily routine when you have to make decisions. Very, very powerful. Another concept characteristic of this organization is I mean, this is not uh, revolutionary. I mean, the, the goal is really to go step by step, start with small changes, make an evolution over time. So prefer evolution over revolution. Another characteristic that these organizations had, this is also a finding of, um, of uh, LALU. These organizations have a clear rule book, an explic explicit rule book. What does it mean? An example is if your organization runs on holacracy, they have to agree on this holacracy constitution. So it's actually a book, like a constitution. Yeah, I think it's five or six chapters. And you have to basically sign it and say, hey, now we run under the holacracy constitution. And all the rules are there, how you run operational meetings, how you run governance meetings. You can um, read it up, and it's clear how your organization should be um, uh, work. Why is that good? I mean, you say, well, I don't want to follow whatever Bible somebody wrote. 
the thing is you don't have to go with holacracy constitution, but the, the goal here is to have a, a rule book which is explicit to bring up transparency and also um, which basically leads then into uh, making tr building trust because you know how decisions are done, how things actually work. So it's very explicit and very clear and also very powerful. And it can be very simple, right? It's not like a book that should be like 200 pages, maybe just one page how decisions get done. So that was more or less the base um, concepts of uh, paradigms of new ways of working. And now I want to make it a bit more concrete because you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. You can actually adopt one of the systems, sociocracy or the sociocratic circle method, holacracy or S3, which are the most uh, known um, uh, systems. And it's actually quite hard to explain them in a 45 minute session because each one sh deserves, I don't know, half a day workshop to get an understanding of it. But I try to uh, give you some insights how they are different, how they are different and how they are structured. But they have a lot of things in common. So what are the overarching goals of Holacracy S3 and Sociocracy? As I said before, transparency is very important and especially transparency, or, uh, who owns the control, who, who controls the power within an organization. So that should be very explicit. And also how you can change the control of power. Then also equality in decision making. So everybody's voice is, is important. It's not the founder's voice or the one with the most experience. It's everybody's voice, very important point. It's also a sense of personal and shared responsibility. So you are accountable if you own a role, but you do it for the purpose of the circle. And I also mentioned that it's all about dynamic and adaptable roles. So it's basically becoming a dynamic and adaptable organization if you adopt one of these, uh, uh, of these models. So holacracy, sociocracy 3.0, so sociocracy. Holacracy was invented around, I think, 2010, maybe a bit earlier. Um, and the uh, holocratic constitution I mentioned before describes the concept of circles, roles, accountabilities, tensions, tactical and governance meetings. That's actually all you have to know to run on holacracy. A typical structure is, circle structure is the one below. Sociocracy 3.0 is a little bit more concept, uh, complex. It's actually a collection of 75 patterns. So one pattern, for example, is how you run on circles or tensions. But they also have seven overarching principles and five concepts. So it's a little bit abstract. That's why there are several ways how you can structure yourself. So it's not just one version, but you can actually pick your own. You can even think it as a Drupal site. So install Drupal core, and then you can install the web form module, whatever module you like, and then uh, you have your own custom solution. So secrecy is a little bit more simple. So there's four core principles, circle, circles, linking or double linking, concession, con consent decision making, and how you give feedback. And in general, you can say holoc holocracy is very, very structured with this constitution. And a lot of IT companies adopt holocracy because it's for, let's say, developers. It's very easy to understand because it's, yeah, it's like more or less like code. Uh, the constitution, by the way, is on GitHub. So you can make merge, merge requests or pull requests for the next uh, version of the holocratic constitution if you want to. And sociocracy is maybe more for social organizations. I know lots of organizations in Switzerland who adopt that, let's say in, in uh, elderly care organizations, even schools. And the one between sociocracy is for the ones who need a custom solution or want a custom solution. And by the way, this is just guidelines. I mean, you can do whatever crassy you want to do. For example, we started with holacracy and now we call it node-cracy because of net node, no-cracy, and we have our own flavor of it. 
and we are happy with that. So it's not that you follow whatever Bible you want to follow, right? So our journey at NetNote, um, by the way, this is the current structure we have. These are the circles we have at NetNote. Um, actually, in 2017, I heard about the book Reinventing Organization, the one I was mentioning before. And then uh, it was the first time I learned about this distributed authority and, you know, this concept of holacracy, etc. I found it very, it, re it resonated very much with me. And we started to, uh, to experiment with the content method. And uh, it took a while, actually, uh, when, until we really adopted holacracy. And this is actually the photo where in a retreat we did, and we had an internal um, workshop, and we adopted holacracy. And personally, myself, I did two workshops about holacracy and I learned it and also became a holacracy coach. And from the very beginning we started to use a tool, the screenshot I just before sh uh, saw you, uh, I, I just showed before with the circles is Hola Spirit. It's one of uh, many tools to um, document your evolution on how you go with, uh, how your organization develops. And we use Hola Spirit for that. Since then, we made many, many iterations. So, um, actually, these are screenshots. We make them every quarter. And we created new circles. We, thought we found out this is wrong. We started new team circles. We split them. We merged them. So we found a model to very dynamically and also very transparently to the whole team to be adaptable. And everybody was always... Um, inform what's going on in the organization, even if you were not part of a specific team. But we also learned that holacracy is not the full solution. So holacracy only gives you one piece. So it's really operational, how you do meetings, how you structure uh, your governance meetings, how you change roles and stuff. But we found there was something lacking. It was about how we come together as humans and then we started to introduce uh, what we call a culture book until today. And the culture book is a collection of um, basically slides now. And we, we also built a website which is fully public. You can look it up. So we describe what is our mindset, what are our tools, and what are our practices in our daily life. And we, we I mean, we use them all the time. So if somebody joins the company, it's the first place we go and say, hey, look, we, we, we use nocracy. This is the structure. This is how we work. And it's very easy to explain what our culture is. And it's very close to daily life. So it's not some document written and then we use it for the next three years. Uh, it's really, um, we update that on time, all the time. That was very important to us by adopting holacracy and then also evolving some other deliverable, the culture book, which we can um, evolve on. So what's next? Uh, basically, we want to cultivate an ethnot forest. So what does it mean? We want to grow as an organization. We want to grow within the teams, grow as individuals, and find flow everywhere. And what I think is important, and it's nothing new, we have to work on soft skills, uh, so it comes very obvious. So if you run on that, and then you cannot give feedback or proper feedback, and also get proper feedback and react open, um, it doesn't work, right? And so we are planning to do a non-violent uh, communication workshop, for example. One thing that also holds us, and probably me as the founder of the company back, I also have old habits still somewhere in my head and they pop up from time to time and I have to really unlearn them. And in the end, what's interesting, when you run on this, uh, these concepts, uh, it comes down to how do you grow as an individual or everybody within the organization. So it, it's a lot of inner work. And it's interesting also to see the growth of uh, people who are within the organization in the last years. So how could you start? 
I mean, the books are out there. Um, I think it in it's interesting that when you do an MBA today, you hardly learn these new concepts. But you can read Reinventing Organizations, Holacracy book, Sociocracy book. It's out there. It's something we should have in the curriculums in the schools. Then also one very easy thing to start is take these circles, this, this map, and discuss it in the team. Where are you? Uh, when are you, where are you when, in what situation, and what is the dynamics within the organization? And a third one, which is uh, also a good way to start, it's called the OS Canvas. So instead of saying, oh, tomorrow I, I, I learned about Holacracy, I want to do that, and so we adopt Holacracy and then we run on that, I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend uh, to start slow and these nine um, fields are different topics you can start and have a con conversation around it. For example, uh, the one on the top right, information and communication. Uh, well, you can discuss how is actually information flowing from whom to whom and why it's like that. And can I give a feedback? If so, how, et cetera, et cetera, right? So who, is, who actually owns the power of information, information sharing? Or what are the meet meetings? H why do we do the meetings the way we do? How they are coordinated? And then you can maybe go deeper and say, what is the policy or the governance of our company? So how do we do decisions? Is it always the boss or project manager or whoever has a, a strong power in the company? Or can we do that differently? So you see the concept, so it's really growing into this, and then at one point you say, well, okay, okay, we have now an understanding, or common understanding how this can develop in the future, then maybe you adopt some system. Yeah, that's it for the moment. So I come back to my calling question in the beginning. How can we facilitate you and me and us, facilitate individuals and organizations to tackle 21st century challenges and foster universal thriving? For me, the answer is it's definitely not the left thing. For me, it's the organic, ever-evolving um, world. And with that said, I have to bring that slide up, join the contribution opportunities the whole week, and please fill also the session survey directly in, in the mobile app. And that's it for my presentation. Maybe you have some questions now. I will re repeat the question. Go ahead. So the question is, uh, how do you um, find an agreement on the next steps in adopting uh, that, that stuff? And there are strong objections towards that. Is that correct? Absolutely. So in Holacracy, there is actually um, the concept of proving the objection, if it's actually a valid objection. And there are four questions. And one question is actually, do you object based on an assumption that something could happen in the future? So theoretically, see a fear, but it's not proven by evidence then the obje objection is invalid. So it's very strong. You actually say, hey, uh, why do you do that? Uh, is th you, you are feared now, but I'm not feared. I want to do that. So what's your problem? 
Obviously, he could say, hey, we tried this in the, p in, in the past, and we tried this, and we tried this, and we lost money. It was, uh, you know, the half of the company left. I said, oh, okay, your option is probably right. So you can test that. Yeah. And also, objections are actually very valid, because an, uh, uh, very valuable, because uh, an objection is always a source for improvement. So in any, every objection, there is some sense of truth, and you have to find the truth. I'm sure if a person objects, you have to find out if it's just objection because you're lazy or you don't, you don't want to, you don't, you don't like change. But there is something inside it, and you have to find it out. Actually, the, the, facilitator, uh, the facilitator's job in a meeting is to find the, the, the reason for that objection. And then if you found it, and if it's a valid objection, you try to integrate it. And one uh, solution, and we do that all the time, is how can we make the project smaller so it's good enough for now and safe enough to try? So you don't have to change everything right now. So you can do and stop it slowly and then learn on the way. Other questions? So there are many feedback options, and it's one of on the culture book. It's many uh, we describe it as feedback, and how we do that. And one important thing is obviously we do retrospectives, very easy. Then uh, we do one-on-ones. That's very very important. So basically, uh, a safe space for two people to come together and discuss certain situations, and maybe also address wha what happened in that situation. Okay. You can do that, and let's go forward, and let's try next time. Yeah, I, um, so the question is who runs the one-on-ones? And uh, sounds like a tension, so I, I immediately uh, react in a holocratic way, so it sounds like a tension. So, yeah, yeah, it's a question, but let's say in, in our organization it's like a tension. So who, why, why, why is this person uh, um, r um, uh, responsible to do one-on-ones? Well, you discuss it and then you say, well, maybe this person is uh, for a long period in the company, he knows a lot of it, and maybe he has the natural accountability to do that, right? So it's like a, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, there, is a, there should be a role for that one-on-one, -on -one. and then there is a process to build that role. And people can object and like it or don't like it. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's very interesting what you say. Uh, it's very interesting what you say because for me it's it's so obvious, and for for you it's not. And I explain my my thought process. So you are actually looking for a plan to solve an issue that might come up in the future. So you have an existing structure, and you don't know how you do it, and you want to have a system in place that can work the next twelve months, somehow like that. And I would say. Well, let's just start. You have people managers, they are the one-on-one -on -one people. And then it's set. And then you can say, in two weeks, somebody comes up and say, I have a tension with that. 
you know, how a people manager knows what we do in a project, so he cannot really coach me, for example, or the pro project manager comes. So it's an evolutionary process. It's not something you design. It's small step, it's iterative. You, you, you start with small changes and start to adopt it. So the best way is actually define a role and then start and see what happens. So my experience is, um, since we made this trans uh, transition, it's much easier to find people because I think people are looking for these purpose-driven organizations and also where they ca can have an impact also on the structure of the organization. That's one part. And then on the other part, you're right. So there is uh, skills that should be there um, that it actually works. But the thing is, you don't have to know it, how it works. You have to be open enough. And you uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, you, wa you should want to learn it once you join, for example, Netnode or such a company. And actually, we have also processes. It w was many tensions about that. How do you learn all the holacracy practices? OK, so we have the holacracy role, and you can always go there and ask questions. We have the one on ones. So it's like a thing we learn how to do that over time. Onboarding, for example, yeah, yeah. And also onboarding, not only onboarding on how you, how the development infrastructure works, but also how we do decisions and how everything works, how we work, how our culture is, basically. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. So the question is, does it work for bigger organizations and does it work for teams, single teams in bigger organizations, right? Um, I don't know. I, I run a small Drupal agency. We are only 12 and I'm not consulting about that. Um, but I was at the conference in earlier this year and Roche, the, the pharma company, they adopted Holacracy with a department or group of 1,500 people. It's like, I don't know how many teams they are. They have like a, a fleet of consultants and they try to shift towards that. So I don't know if that worked out or they are now adopting it. I don't know. Are you from Roche? No, <laughs> you're not from Roche. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, Roche is like 70,000, and it's like the Switzerland branch, uh, they, they adopt it. And uh, what I can say, I've, I, I have the tendency, but this is my personal view, I think it should be very top-down. If the leadership team is not into that and sees it as, you know, we do new work now and we are fancy, then it doesn't work out. That's my personal opinion. But okay. Any other questions? It's very interesting, actually, yeah? Yeah, so the question is, uh, does it work out financially for us? That's, that does. And the other one, how we do it if it doesn't work well, something like that. I mean, uh, personally, I have to say, uh, we as Netnode are 
as uh, the most resilient than ever we were before in the history of the company. What I'm saying is everybody can now see risks issue and bring that up. So we are really agile and also, you know, we really sense and not only you know the founder or the owner of the company, but everybody is actually sensing and bringing up tensions. So I am very confident that we are much stronger than we, we when we go with this uh, than without. So what happens if uh, let's say business is not going well? I mean, you have its dynamic roles. You can also go back to a more reddish way of organization. And that's maybe not even bad. During crisis, it, it, it totally makes sense. You have a leader that says, we do that as a next step. And if we as an organization adapt to that, say, okay, now it's not going well. Okay, we need somebody that exactly says, what's the next step? And we, we, we do that naturally. Well, why not doing that? But this is not the default assumption. I think that's also the very important uh, thing. S you have a question? Oh, okay. So I just want to tell one story or one one image you can think of, and it's actually by the by the founder or the, the inventor of holacracy, Brian Robertson, and he says running an organization on on a traditional power hierarchy is like you sit in a car, and the handbrake is already in place, and you try to push on the on the on the gas pedal you know, coming forward because there's all these rules and stuff in place and, you know, you're going to come forward. We have to finish. Okay, uh, let me finish that one. But running on holacracy is actually, you, you go full throttle, you can go, 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 and then at one point you see, oh, there is a, um, uh, you know, there is something coming up, an obstacle, and say, should we break, should we break? No, we don't, we don't. And then you don't, meet, you don't hit it, you go next. So that was cool. You're really fast, you're developing, innovating. And then maybe something happens, you know. And you say, okay, maybe this was too fast. So then you start to hit the break and not from the beginning. So that's the concept of it. Yeah, yeah I hope I could inspire you and we have to close. And uh, I'm here also if there are questions. Thank you very much.